Okay, so we're recording now. And um, I'd also like to remind everybody that tomorrow is the um, spring CDL hike. Anybody's welcome to join us. Um, if you want more details, you can contact me. We're hiking at 10 o'clock starting at Greenbrier State Park. Um, can I start, Alan? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, first off, thank you for um, asking me to do this. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Second, um, uh, I'm in a position of life when most of the time I give these kinds of talks, I'm talking about the work that a student did uh, with some input from me. In this case, the student is uh, Priyanka Ranade, uh, who many of you know well. Um, so really, I'm presenting to you some work she has been doing um, uh, with me um, over the last few years. And um, I don't think she is able to join today, given the constraints of uh, her work. But um, I was also warned that the entire NLP class is sitting in this discussion. So uh, don't don't quiz me too co closely about um, Rogue One versus Rogue Two scoring um, and in unigrams versus bigrams when we get to that uh, slide, please. So I'm going to talk about shaping opinion um, and influencing societies through narratives. Um, I'll start with um, some examples. And again, uh, this is, a work that is done in the clear. I don't have any clearances. All I know is what is gets reported in the media, uh, nothing more. So um, in terms of what gets reported in the media, and I don't want to pick on a particular country, but those are the things when I Googled for this stuff in the two days ago, um, where there are allegations that a country will use um, social media um, and generative AI actually to um, influence elections. Um, so here's sort of the brief version of the talk, which is that we are often have been in this country talking about misinformation, misinformation versus disinformation, but if you think about it in a socio-political context, misinformation and, and disinformation is rarely a singular artifact, which you can say, aha, someone said that, you know, this vaccine is only 94% effective. In fact, it is 99.8% effective and you debunked, quote unquote, uh, that piece of information. In, in most social political contexts, it's not. It's like, well, should you get vaccinated? How important are vaccines, right? Uh, does this political party have the best interests of people like you in their mind when, so it, these are narratives. And second, especially in sociopolitical contexts, it often lies in the eyes of the beholder. So we come from, often people like me come from science and engineering domains where like, well, yeah, it's an undisputed fact that the sun rises in the east, and if you suggest that sun rises in the west, it's a clear piece of you know misinformation. Uh, many things are less clear, um, and I don't want to give specific examples, but in our socio-political context, you can see a bunch of them. So influence operations try to mix facts, opinions, and very small bits of tailored misinformation right, to craft a narrative and shape opinions. So if someone says someone, something that is blatantly untrue, you can figure it out, most people can. But often what people are doing is taking facts that are true, opinions that um, they or others may have about them, um, and then seeding in just a small thing or two that's not easily verifiable immediately, um, basically shape of opinion, and it's much, much, much easier to do today in the world where uh, what the claim is that Gen Z gets most of its news from Instagram or TikTok in, in this country right now. Um, so generating, you know, content to feed into these things is not that hard. 
And if you are either a country or a company that actually controls the algorithms that decides what gets shown to most people, it's even easier. And this is a relatively low cost and, and significantly hard to attribute troublemaking uh, for nation state adversaries, right? So much like we say in the cybersecurity domain, we would like to detect and attack left of exploit. Um, the question we are trying to address very broadly in, and Priyanka has made some progress in that direction, which is a broad theme of research. Can we detect these narratives left of exploit? So that's sort of the frame in which I'm going to talk today. Uh, feel free to ask questions, by the way, as I go along. Um, I don't want to make this a didactic, I know. Web seminars can sometimes just be the speaker speaking. So I'll give you an example. And again, this is all from the press, what's reported in the media. So in 2018, there was a typhoon, um, Jebby, that caused the closure of Ansai Airport, um, as the um, international airport serving Osaka in Japan. And people were evacuated. Um, airport buses provided by the airport were used to. Uh, evacuate people from the airport to designated places. And then, uh, since it's a big international airport, uh, the consulates of the various countries that had diplomatic representation there were told to arrange to pick up their nationals from those regions and then move them. And in some cases, airlines were doing that coordination with nations. So, a Chinese airline grouped all of its passengers into specific buses and, you know, Nothing wrong with that, just standard stuff. Hey, everyone on flying this airline, you go to this bus, right? And again, undisputable normal fact, the Chinese consulate in that area arranged to transport Chinese passengers, citizens of China, from um, those designated points to some hotels in Osaka. And this was done by other countries and airlines. Nothing wrong, a bunch of facts. Okay, now we add some opinion into this. So. Again, as would normally happen in most nations of the world, the news media in China covered this, and you know they had interviews uh, where uh, uh, you know uh, people, uh, Chinese nationals, were praising the efforts of their government to, you know, put them up in Osaka and the consulate and things like that. And one passenger, or maybe it was a few passengers, commented that they had also let into the airport bus. Uh, passengers from Taiwan, if they identified, they said we were, we were Chinese, and, and this is, that's a complex geopolitical question um, on how people from Taiwan should be addressed. But ignoring that, this is what that person or a, a small set of people offered as their opinion. And the Chinese, Chinese consulate in Osaka put out a statement that they had coordinated with the Japanese side, um, which they had. But the way the statement was phrased, it could be read to suggest that, well, they had told the Japanese folks, and here, here, here is the kind of things that they should do, and those were done. Those are all opinions. Again, everything is fine. And so you say, okay, so where's the problem? Now you enter into cybersecurity. So there is a very active bulletin board in Taiwan, PTT, um, where posts began to appear saying the ROC government which is the official name of the government of in, in Taiwan, had failed, you know, its citizens who had to declare themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And this, they were citing news stories in, you know, in, in, in Chinese media where I was just describing, you know, they described the evacuation and the opinions of some people. Um, and these posts omitted the fact that, look, all the buses that had evacuated people were, arranged by the airport, right? No particular government or airline or country or whatever had anything to do with those buses that took people out of the airport. They had to do with where those people were put up. Um, it turns out that most of these uh, were fake accounts with AI generated pictures of people um, and they were newly created and so on and so forth. So you see fact, opinion, a little bit of very tailored misinformation, just a little bit injected into the process. And here is the effect, and this would not be uncommon in any um, relatively open democratic society today. The mainstream media in Taiwan immediately picked this up, the story, and said, 
it is alleged that you know blah 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 and of course the more sensational of the sources you know created these clickbaity headlines none of this should be uh, unfamiliar and this led to then you know a lively discussion on the internet and some very hateful words were said about the the diplomat that represented Taiwan in Osaka and he committed suicide. So this is sort of the tragic end to the story. Um, but you see what is happening, right? There are some real facts on the ground. There are opinions related to those facts. And then you add just a little bit of misinformation in the right place. And you craft a narrative that you then use, you know, sort of, you know, the the standard open structures in an open democratic society to begin to amplify those narratives, to begin to talk about those narratives. And so this is sort of the crux of our talk. This is the example. Now, having said that, none of this is new, right? I mean, rumors have existed before there were um, electronics. And even in social media, this is sort of a well-known problem, just the scale of it, especially given generative AI, has become significantly more. I mean, creating that crafted, tailored misinformation has become uh, easier um, given Gen AI. So I'll give you some examples. Um, uh, Dr. Finan and I have been working on some of these problems for, I guess, over a decade now. Um, so I have some things from stuff that was done by our former students. So here's an example around 2013, um, where, you know, when Pope Francis was elected, um, the Pope, um, there was this real verified Twitter account, and then there was this other account um, that was eventually banned by Twitter, but not before this person who used the Pope's sort of um, name before he became the Pope um, to create an account. and was tweeting against, you know, church's uh, policy against um, LGBTQ folks. Um, here's another example, uh, this one, you know, where you could actually call it monetary damage. So Delta, you know, uh, started, you know, remember airlines and all these consumer facing groups were going into uh, Twitter. So Delta had an account called Delta Assist. Um, and someone again used the same logo and created this account called the Fly Delta Assist and actually posted things saying, hey, the first, like, I forget it was like 500 or 1,000 people uh, that reply to this sharing their experience on Delta will be given a free round trip ticket. So much so that, you know, the official Delta handle had to post saying, that's not us. Um, um, Now, there are actually physical or social consequences to, to these kinds of things. So this is an example from an, even a year before those things. Um, so again, these are all from when Twitter was relatively new. Um, so the then Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, created a official sort of handle called at PMO India, which had his picture, right? Um, and then someone else shortly thereafter created uh, a fake account called at PM zero India. Now you can see, and, and he put that person, sorry, uh, put that picture there. So you can see it was a clear attempt to, to look like the official account. And there were also sort of parody accounts. So there were like six fake profiles, but I mean, this is an obvious parody account. You know, it sort of calls itself Dr. Yum Yum Singh, um, doesn't have, like, has a cartoon there. So. I mean, I'm not talking about this kind of stuff. I'm talking about this kind of stuff. Um, and what this account did was, this is around the time that was the beginning of the Rohingya issue in uh, Myanmar, uh, Burma. And what it did is it took some pictures from there and put it in um, as representatives was what was happening. So for those of you who are not familiar with the geography of India, the northeastern region of India, um, I mean, the, the people ethnically share um, characteristics with Southeast Asian uh, folks. So, you know, the pictures look, could be transposed, you know, so you could take a picture from Burma, 
Myanmar and say this was happening in the northeastern part of India. And Rohingyas look much more like your traditional view of South Asian people, people like me. Um, and so this picture, this guy basically started saying all this is happening in India um, and uh, people from the southern part of India um, are being, uh, you know, beaten up or whatever it was um, by people in the northeastern part. And it was, it instigated some riots that actually happened in northeast and it led to a mass exodus before the government could come in and say, no, 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 this is fake. Uh, that took like, you know, two, three, four days, the people began to leave. People of the Northeast uh, part of India began to leave some of the southern parts of India because they were like, oh my God, this is happening there. And then some, some retaliation might happen here. Uh, so there can be real serious social consequences of something like this. There can be financial crime. So uh, right around the time of the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, people created fake accounts and actually got them to donate small amounts of money. Uh, but this one, I think, got about 50,000 people to not just RT, but, you know, give a buck. That's $50,000 right there for a fake person. Um, here are other consequences, right? So um, AP's account was hacked and someone actually Put out something that says two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. Some of you may remember this. The stock market actually fell for four minutes before the White House issued a statement saying this is completely fake. Uh, 60 Minutes was hacked. Uh, more jocularly, um, the Burger King account was hacked and a McDonald's picture was uh, put in there. Um, Chief's account was hacked, et cetera. Um, and this is some work that we've actually done in the past where when Hurricane Sandy happened, people were posting this kind of stuff. So all that to say that there is misinformation in social media is not new. Misinformation in general, spreading rumors is not new. Um, and there is a body of work that has focused on detecting this kind of um, information. Some of it is automated, right? So it's like, think about how spam filters work. They say, well, if it's badly written and has you know links that are purporting to be something else, it's probably spam. So there, there are various kinds of automated efforts to say what is uh, misinformation. However, most of them rely on a training data set. Those training data set tend to involve manual golden annotations, and that has stirred its own batch of controversy. Uh, as I said, it's a complex sociopolitical um, technical system uh, where people don't necessarily agree on the basic facts, right? And again, I don't want to give very specific examples, but you know we have a bunch of them uh, in our country right now. So, there are known approaches, you know, you can detect. There are people talking about spreading, um, using. Uh, so there have been interesting work on information cascades, uh, actually, and also on disinformation cascades, on how things go viral, if you would, for the lack of a better word. And people have looked at if something bad is spreading that you think is wrong, how do you counter it by injecting information? And this very interesting graph theoretical work. Um, pioneered, I think, by Leskovic when he was a PhD student um, with Falut Sos and CMU. Um, but they have limited success. And this is especially insidious in um, social media that permits end-to-end uh, -end encryption with forwarding. So I can get a message and I can forward it, uh, but no one will know where that message originally came from. Um, and uh, this is one of the things where I think law enforcement has been at odds with um, it, it, law enforcement in India has been at odds with WhatsApp for a long time. Um, because again, about six or seven years ago, there were actual lynchings, lynchings, like believe it or not, real people were killed because this kind of rumors were spread saying, hey, there are these kind of people. Um, you know, there'll be strangers in your town that will want to know stuff and they're out there to kidnap your children. Very real looking 
content was generated like that and was spread using these um, end to end encrypted um, social media platforms like WhatsApp that led to people actually being lynched uh, before the police could intervene. So, again, um, information operations are not new. So, if you read history, you can record these kinds of things going all the way back. And um, in this country, um, part of the, the whole independence movement from Britain began as pamphleteering, right? You published pamphlets, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and so on and so forth. So, information operations shaping the narrative to favor you is not something new. But if you look at what is happening in um, Ukraine and Israel, there is as much of a kinetic war being fought as a war on social media, right? And in open societies, democratic societies like the one we live in, no matter how imperfect they may be, you're providing a direct reach to the hearts and minds of your citizens potentially to your adversaries. So this is a far more challenging problem in open societies. I mean, one way to fix this problem is to say, um, the country uh, will er erect some kind of a digital, you know, moat around and only certain approved pieces of information will be allowed to spread. But you know, if you're an open society, you believe in free speech, that's not possible. And then the second part of this, so, so the first part of this is a sort of a political science, public policy problem that I'm not qualified to address. The second part that you know, we've done some interesting work on is, uh, can you generate plausible but fake information? Because again, uh, going back to the point I made earlier about this being a low cost, um, effort for the adversary. If I can generate plausible information, which is easy for me to generate, but very hard for you to then detect and try to debunk, I win. I mean, or rather, the Nash equilibrium of that system eventually will be in my favor, which is why uh, whether you look at, um, you know, spam in emails or, um, phishing or false links or whatever, you know, false advertising, it, the Nash equilibrium always ends up favoring um, the people who are generating spam. So let me give you a very specific example. This is uh, some work we published uh, in IGCNN a couple of years ago. So um, a part of your modern um, SOC operations um, rely on CTI, cyber threat intelligence. It's often provided as XML or JSON feeds, um, you know, the IBMs and the Taloses and the whatevers of the world will charge you several thousand dollars or tens of thousands of dollars a month to feed you real-time updated information that they are discovering on the net or their labs are like, you know, exploding malware samples and finding out stuff. So um, it's information about cybersecurity vulnerabilities and exploits that are out there. It's very valuable to any SOC operator. Um, and it's also used, you know, we've used it in our own research to train AI-based cyber defense systems. The problem is that once you once your adversary knows that you're using this kind of threat feed um, and using it to train your AI system, it will begin to poison that data, right? Um, so, you know, here are some things um, that were um, identified by the Google Threat Analysis Group as uh, providing fake information, right? So if fake security research accounts and created, put out fake peg block flows and things like that. And you might think that requires a person, you know, to spend time doing it. And what our research showed it, um, that there, it, it doesn't, right? So since the last year and a half or so, chat GPT has just sort of taken over the world, if you would. But before ChatGPT and everyone beginning to talk about Gen AI, those of us that work in the field were playing with earlier incarnations. And so this is some work we did with GPT-2. And I'll talk about how we generated fake stuff um, with GPT-2. So we created a fake uh, cybersecurity 
corpus, which are sort of real threat intelligence that um, relate to cybersecurity. We fine tuned GPT 2's publicly available model. So it was the public view model is trained on standard news corpora. Uh, we fine tuned it by training it. So that's a foundation model. We fine tuned the foundation model with our cybersecurity corpus. And then we said, let's let's have it generate uh, fake threats. And then we evaluated how good they were. So to give you a flavor, right? Um, so here is a um, so we took some real threat intelligence, right? And then we took the first few words in that real threat intelligence. And we gave it as the generation input. This is GPT-2. This is not doing any RAG or any fancy stuff like that. None of that. We'll talk about that later. Just GPT-2 trained, fine-tuned on a cybersecurity corpus. Um, so see what is happening, right? Okay, you can say the first one, yeah, the fake stuff is not the same as the real thing, but it's saying, plausible things uh, that may are possibly true, but look at what happens when you actually begin to talk about specific vulnerabilities. So um, this was done within a few months of the SolarWinds um, hack. So this was the real description summary of the SolarWinds hack. We just took Malicious domain in SolarWinds hacked, uh, turned into kill switch. We just took the first sentence and we fed it. And look, it has now come up with a perfectly plausible vulnerability that could be a part of a real threat intelligence. It just wasn't. This is not what SolarWinds did, right? It did not use a vulnerability in the Win32K framework to attack uh, targets through crafted code. Uh, Here's another example, right? Uh, of an attack. Um, so this was a real threat intelligence about the quiz and survey master plugin for some versions of WordPress. Um, and the real thing was that it made um, possible for unauthenticated attackers to up, uh, attackers to upload binary uh, to achieve remote code. And look at the generation. It said there was a fake CSRF token. Um, that was ex exploiting something in the survey.php admin panel, which was not true, right? So it's, but if I just show this to you, how would you know that this is the true? I mean, if I didn't tell you which one was true and which was correct, and I asked you, I suspect um, most of you wouldn't know unless you happen to know all the details of that specific vulnerability in your head at that instance, you wouldn't know. So we put that, that was our research question, is the generated CTI plausible enough to bypass cyber, experienced cyber threat hunters and analysts. So we asked um, 10 threat hunters in the local community, each with at least 15 years of experience, and they were given 280 generated samples, and they were asked to say, um, what is true, what is false, right? And so the split was roughly half half in the actual data, right? In the actual data, half the things were true, half the things were false. But if you look at this matrix, right? The true things are true, right? Which is great. But look at when what happens when the actual data is false. The participants still think this is true because Without specific experience, if I give you this, this, and this, unless you specifically know the details of that attack, you say, yeah, sounds reasonable. There are vulnerabilities in Win32K framework, and that can be used to exploit. It's just not what Solar, Solar Winds did, but people can set up CSRF tokens and hijack sessions. It's entirely possible. It's just not what this vulnerability was about, right? So. Seventy-eight percent of the fake things 
were looked through to these very, very experienced threat hunters. So imagine, and what was my cost in doing this? That was to train GPT-2 once with a corpus I had created. I took a one-time cost, and now I can amortize it over hundreds of thousands of these fake things that I'm, I'm creating fake accounts and posting, you know, threat analyses and whatnot, which are being picked up and then fed to you. And how do you know which ones are wrong? Because it's not easy to figure out. So I hope you see sort of the magnitude, and I'm deliberately giving you an example from an uncontroverted, uncontroversial domain like cybersecurity. I could do the same thing for politics. In fact, people have done the same thing for politics. So in our ongoing work, which is sort of the crux of this talk, we're trying to say, can you detect these narratives as they're forming before they get exploited? So now I'm, my parents were both from the literature field. I'm not, I'm just going to pretend to be from the literature field for a few seconds. Um, but you have streams of information, they're talking about events, and as humans, we piece them into some temporal sequence to create stories. Um, and you could have stories about current world events, or social media based, or news based. You can have stories about um, history. You can have fictional stories. They all share this idea that there is a narrative that is a sequence of events that have some temporal relationship between them. Now, those of you who are, I don't know if there's anyone here who's a literary critic, but you might argue, well, that's a very uh, modernist definition of uh, what a story is, and you're not accounting for uh, more postmodern definitions um, like Marquez and others sort of that bend the linear narrative structure. Um, and that's a good point. Um, we can discuss that orthogonally, but for now, I will just say that the key interest here in you know these the kinds of information operations I'm talking about is mostly linear narratives. Um, so we're not talking about 100 years of solitude or or whatever that um, your favorite Marquez novel is. Um, so we're ordering stuff into plot sequences. And what we are trying to do with it is, um, as an example, um, we are looking at a task that intelligence analysts are routinely called upon to do. Um, they are given intelligence reports, lots of raw source data, and their job is to come up with a narrative summary that gets passed up the chain, eventually in some cases to the president in, in the PDB, right? Uh, so the question is, can you see when, how a narrative is being crafted and see what the narrative is, just looking at the... So, um, this is just something that I think we were talking about. Um, the challenges are that sort of, you know, you will have different sources. If you're consulting different sources, they have their own biases. How do you factor that? And then um, at least in modern query based systems, it's often a matter of how are you phrasing and you've all experienced that depending on how you ask Google for some piece of information, you will get different uh, responses. So think about our work. Um, as computational narrative constructor, we have a set of randomly ordered article D1 through Dn that are retrieved by a keyword search query about some event E, uh, which we know contain plot points, P1, P2. Uh, and our job is to clue them together into a sequence, the current work in that space. It doesn't think about narratives, but the closest work in that space is, you know, dynamic topic modeling, information ranking, timeline generation, query optimizations, things of that nature. Um, and here is some interesting work that was done at UMBC on the left hand side um, uh, by some of Tim Oates' students uh, some years ago. I'm just giving that as an example. Um, so the sequencing there is essentially temporal, right? Um, 
I'm trying to say how is does it make sense that this article follows this article in a temporal sequence? This article says that Freeman Havasky has announced his retirement as the president of UMBC, and this other article says uh, Valerie Shares Ashby has been appointed as the president of UMBC. Well, those two events, uh, there's like a causality, temporal causality there. So this is how I that that's how my narrative would look like. So we're trying to do something more. We're trying to say. Um, are there thematic frames? You know, I should put these articles together because they are all trying to convince me that there has been a leadership transition in UMBC. Um, so, um, what we are doing is modeling sort of events as narratives using semantic web based approaches. Um, and we've developed a system that I'm going to talk about. Um, briefly, well, I guess over the next 10 minutes to leave time for questions. Um, that combines a lot of um, uh, recent developments in NLP and AI um, to address this task. So, given that most of this audience is um, probably from the technology side, I don't want to spend too much time talking about um, autoregressive uh, decoders and RAGs. I'll say a few words about RAGs towards the end, but um, what, what we're using right now, again, given the kind of things, is we're using something called the inverted plot pyramid, which is a journalism artifact, and once I sort of explain it, it'll be clear. Uh, but it draws from uh, um, literary theories that talk about plot pyramids, right? That you start and then you build this kind of towards this uh, big event in the plot, which is the plot highlight, the big reveal, the whatever, and then sort of your story tails off into sort of they, they lived happily ever after. So, so there are theories of um, uh, plots, plot pyramids, um, and journalism kind of flips in on its head. It's called an inverted plot pyramid. So we'll talk about that. So here's the sort of the traditional inverted plot pyramid that journalist talks about, which is sort of the lead. The lead is a summary that has the who, what, when, where, and why. And then there is the body that has a series of crucial delineated events, incidents that feed into the lead that you created. And then finally, there is a tale which has either some kind of conclusion or some kind of an opinion expression. And that's where you see persuasion tactics uh, being used saying, yeah, these things happened and what they really mean is or what you should take away from this story is. And again, good journalists try very hard not to do this. So, for the task we are doing, we are, we're using this framework, although in the system we have built, there is, in theory, we could be doing literary analyses like that too, but that's not what we're doing right now. Um, Renka is focused on this information operations that state adversaries might do against uh, a country. So, um, again, I don't want to read these out. You can see. Um, what they are. But the key thing to remember is that, you know, the lead is essentially the who, what, when, where, why. Um, and then everything else is sort of the evidence, right? So the way we are thinking about it is I am giving you a series of articles or whatever uh, about some event or events. And the analyst tasks is to produce this lead. And then our task is to say, yeah, these are the kind, if you think, look at all these disparate sources, this is what they want you to conclude. And then we also want to identify what persuasion tactics are. Are they appealing to your sentiment? Um, are they giving you appeal from authority? Things of that nature, right? Um, so, some of the techniques we've used, uh, there's obviously some NER that you have to do. So, we've done that using SPACI. Um, 
build some kin and then disease and at the end this becomes a multi-label um, classification problem on are you talking about the who the what the when etc and then we've built an ontology that captures the kind of things it's called the event uh, narrative ontology see some of this here um and what that does is it sucks all this information and now it creates an event plot graph that has all that information that was in these disparate text or potentially other media sources we're focusing on text right now represented as a knowledge graph right and you can see it has these kinds of um, assertions that you know this new story has a plot point um, this tends to be about what it is and this is typically a who um, the where the plot point could be a who or a where and so on and so forth so now the next step you have this you built this ontology you populated this ontology to have a knowledge graph and now what so what we're saying is what narrative is this these this set of things that you've given me in response to a query are they trying to construct a narrative and what we do is we used rag um, to construct the narrative by essentially saying okay before we go there um, in this case uh, we tuned um, gpt neo with the news intelligence um, corpus we fine-tuned it we also did some uh, tuning to help it identify these plot points um, that we were talking about earlier things like who what why persuasion opinion things of that nature and then what we do is on that knowledge graph we do a query because we know what the plot points are in the lead right we we generate the query that says tell me what is the who what when where why from this set of news articles around and this is the only thing that you have to customize. Oops. This is the only thing that you see right here. This is a story about Ocean Gate. For those of you that don't remember, that was that submarine, uh, that real deep sea exploration thing that was uh, going to look at the Titanic and something bad happened and everyone aboard died, right? Um, so we said, okay, I'm an analyst. I've been tasked to report up. So you've been constantly sucking all the new stuff, creating in the background your knowledge graph. I'm going to say well tell me what's the narrative so the first thing we will do is we run this sparkle query and we put out we pull out what we think are things related to who when uh, you know where why what etc and then we use this as the augment prompt to geo gpt neo to say generate a report right so we give this prompt and here is what it generates for the lead here it what it generates for the body right um, and here is what sort of the tail kind of thing is in this case it was that the coverage overshadowed right here is the same thing done for the train derailment in east uh, palestine um, in ohio you notice that it correctly created these kinds of summaries but in this case uh, the tail right is a persuasion tactic where an opinion is being offered reporters made overblown accusations about the derailment right? so an analyst can basically now turn to this and say what what is the narrative out there about ocean gate and we'll figure it out right and because if you look at the body uh, thing we have in the ontal in the knowledge graph now we point to the sources and the provenance of where that information came from the analyst can say oh someone's trying to persuade us that um, oh i don't know um, there is some flaw in you know state of maryland's voting system all right let's see what evidence there and then i can say aha this is where they're injecting um, some misinformation and things of that nature but even if I don't go all the way there, I am now aware that a narrative is being crafted that is trying to push me to think in a certain direction. 
Now, evaluating this kind of stuff is very hard, um, especially automatically. Um, so uh, what we did was some of these are news events, right? Um, where in Wikipedia, you will have a summary. So now what we did was we said, okay, how good is our summary compared to this summary? The first assumption is this summary is the gold standard. Not necessarily true. The second assumption is this summary was created by reading the same set of articles that we had access to. Also not true. So with those limitations. Um, uh, the rogue ones. So uh, for those of you not uh, from from this field, rogue one, rogue two are um, um, engram based techniques that people used to see how similar two things are. Um, so rogue one, we did pretty well. Rogue one is a unigram based approach. We did pretty well. Um, so a number like sixty, whatever, is considered fairly good. Uh, rogue two, which is bigram based, we were in what was called like a moderately good thing. The very good would have been like I think 35 or above or 40 or above. But really, these are as I said, because of all the just the simple biasing of what articles is Wikipedia accessing. This was written by a person. Maybe that person. I mean, you know, there have been all kinds of things floating around saying uh, Wikipedia is uh, not exactly an entirely neutral, you know, summary site. Um, kids are told don't cite Wikipedia, right? Um, in in your high schools. So. What we are doing now, and these are some very preliminary numbers, um, we're essentially doing qualitative. So we are turning to people who are in the intelligence analysis business and saying, based on the work you're doing, do you think this is a good summary that identifies those narrative plot points for the train uh, disaster in East Palestine or Ocean Gate, we're trying to keep it on general new stuff, right? And so some numbers that you are seeing here. So fluency is just, this is the easiest to explain. It's a Likert scale thing between zero and five that said, essentially how good was the summary? And so in this case, we were talking to uh, five people who were given stories about, you know, the raw material and the summary about five different topics, two of whom you saw there, and were asked, well, how good of a summary this is, you know, one to five Likert scale, and so they thought 4.2. And then we also did, you know, terms that were in common and terms that were not in common. So um, the best that this could have been um, was 16. We got 13, you know, on an average, we got more than 13 things that should have been in common correctly identified and um, this should have been four, five, and we got two and a half out of them correctly saying, here are the things that were not, um, that the analysts thought were important, but our summary didn't think it was so. These are encouraging results and as we speak, we're doing a much larger study um, with which we hope to be able to report sort of the near future. So hopefully this gives you an idea. Um, once again, sort of going back to my summary points, it's a relatively low cost endeavor for me to generate fake information and seed it into the information ecosystem, fake but plausible information, um, not just for very technical stuff like cybersecurity threats, but, you know, events of the day. Um, and detecting these is a high cost endeavor right now because it requires manual sort of fact checking. And even the manual fact checking is, at least in social political systems, not uh, without controversy. So for very good reason, we're not talking about misinformation or disinformation. We're trying to say, is a narrative being crafted? And that narrative may well be correct, right? Uh, a narrative may be crafted that says, um, I don't know, everyone should uh, uh, walk at least 30 minutes a day. There's a bunch of stories coming out, but that's a narrative. We will identify it, right? 
and we will give you the sort of the journalist uh, inverted plot pyramid who what why where what was the cause so what is the lead what are the evidence that backing up and is some at the end is some kind of sort of a conclusionary thing that is a persuasion tactic that's being used to craft you uh, to to get you to think in a certain way so let me just stop here i i hope uh, um i'm open to any questions This is Rick. Uh, great presentation, great technology. Uh, question from a practical sense. How long, what will be the time, if you're an analyst, uh, what will be the lead time, do you think, if this was put in a production environment to, for the analyst to determine whether a narrative was being created and what it might be? I'm thinking the heavier load would be on collecting the data to feed into the model maybe changing the model from cybersecurity to current events to geographical regions or whatnot. But um, do you see this, you know, maybe uh, being like a multi-day process to collect enough material to feed feed into the system? Um, giving, uh, what would the, time, the work load be like? The, does that question so, so, so thank you for the kind words, Rick. And that's, I think that's an excellent sort of um, uh, question. So I think, I think there are two parts to this, right? There's the, there's the actual gathering the raw news, the raw this thing. Um, I suspect, uh, as I made the disclaimer up front, Rick, you know, I have exactly zero clearances, so I don't know what happens on the classified side of the world. Sure. But if I am a modern um, intelligence agency, I probably have crawlers that are out there. Um, that are gathering a lot of this information um, at scale already. Um, you know, in the old days, the, all the newspapers would come and the analysts would open it. And these days, they're probably being gathered. The so that's one burden which I don't know how to estimate. I can um, sort of estimate the computational burden. This is not particularly hard, but if you scale it up, the issue will be essentially the kind of issues that you had with. Um, if you would um, streaming databases about a decade or so ago, right? Where you, so right now I'm doing this as I am interested in everything about Ocean Gate. Pull this out, give me the plot summary. Whereas realistically, what you would have is an analyst saying something like, "I'm interested in anything related to nuclear proliferation in Southeast Asia," right? So there'd be a standing query that would constantly be executed, I don't know, once a day, once every five hours, depending on the criticality of uh, that information and how current that topic is. You know, uh, nuclear proliferation in, in West Asia, maybe something you run uh, every half an hour if you, are, if you have analysts uh, negotiating with certain powers in the Middle East uh, to not develop a nuclear program, but you run it once every uh, six months if uh, there's nothing like that happening. So that scale computationally, I think, can be handled using um, both some advanced computing equipment, but also some clever um, technologies from the streaming database world that could be applied here. But we haven't done that because we're not sort of product. If if I were to productionize it, I would build bring in um, that the standing query streaming data kind of technology. Right. Things. Okay. Thanks. How does your work fit into the context of what other people are doing and what other people have done? So that's an interesting, uh, excellent question, Alan, and I, I wish I had time to say more. So to the best of my understanding, right, there is a lot of work in sort of misinformation detection, right? We're trying to find some wrong thing that someone is saying. That's a different class of work. There has been a lot of work in that space. I think the better comparison for us is the kind of work that is done manually today uh, by say literary analysts or journalists or whoever who would be like, okay, I have to report a story about this. So I'll go interview people and talk to them. To the best of our knowledge, there is very little computational work. So I had this interesting conversation with the Dean of, uh, of a big J school and 
you know, they were very interested because they don't think about this from a computer. I mean, they think this is a journalist's job to, to gather this, but it's the same thing, you know, it's an analyst job, but we're just providing the computational support. So we are better compared with things that are completely manual today. Things that are automated today are probably better than us, but then they're also asking a far uh, a simpler question, which is, is there an individual piece of wrong information rather than, uh, and by the way, even there often, I mean, a lot of, lot of the wrong information work is we consulted six trusted sources and they didn't agree that, well, now you're back to what are your trusted sources. So this is more about saying, is there an effort to reach a certain conclusion based on all of these things that we can detect? Are there any more questions? Well, if not, um, let's thank our speaker. And in two weeks, uh, Dan Ragsdale will be here from the White House to talk about national um, cybersecurity policy. Thank you very much, Anupam. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time today. Bye-bye.